All right, so we are keeping on in our series in Matthew this morning. We're in Matthew 10, uh, verses 16 through 25. Uh, so real quick, we have a rule uh, in the Stahl household that we institute um, when it comes to theme parks. If we, I have four kids, if we were to take our kid to a theme park, we have a rule that we have in our house. If you are tall enough to ride on the ride, you are getting on the ride. There is like no option, okay? So back in the spring, uh, we went to Disneyland and California Adventure. So my oldest son, he turned eight this summer. Uh, he had just grown to four feet tall. We're short people in our family. Uh, so he finally made it to four feet tall, and now he is eligible to ride on the Incredicoaster at California Adventure. So that, not that huge Ferris wheel, that thing, if you've been there before, a uh, really fun roller coaster. So he spent all week talking about how excited he was. He's telling all his friends at school how he's going to ride on the Incredicoaster. So fast forward to the day we get to California Adventure. Uh, we buy the Lightning Pass or whatever it's called. Uh, me, Kristen, and Easton bypass the entire line, and uh, Easton starts to get close to the front of the line, and he starts to immediately regret his decision. Uh, he's literally like chewing his nails. He's not a nail chewer, but he's just like, Mom and Dad, I, I want to go back with Grammy and my brothers. And we're like, no, you have no choice. Uh, he literally, you know those bars, he's trying to like dip under the bar to like escape from us and we're just like, no. So you go down the stairs to get on the actual roller coaster and they assign you what lane you're going to be in, right? Uh, where do they seat me and Easton? Literally the front two seats. Like we are row one, like the sweet spot in a roller coaster, right? Uh, I had to literally pick Easton up and set him in the seat. He was unwilling. And some of you are probably like, wow, Michael, you're intense. No, I'm trying to build character. I'm trying to build young men in my house, okay? So the girl that pushes go is looking at me like I'm an abusive father. And she's just kind of like half laughing, half like, is he going to be okay? And I'm like, yeah, he's good. Don't worry. So you pull around and then the roller coaster takes off. Easton is death gripping my hand, okay? So like never has held my hand so tight. Uh, he wasn't crying, so don't judge me. Uh, he just wasn't looking forward to the big loop where you go upside down. About a minute into the ride, he opens his eyes. Uh, he slowly realizes the ride's not going to kill him. Uh, he kept death gripping my hand, but he started to actually enjoy the ride. So here's the whole picture. You see, by the end, he was finally smiling. So we come in, the roller coaster parks. What were the words that came out of his mouth? Dad, can we do that again? No, Dad's a pastor. I could only afford one lightning line ticket, okay? Anytime any of the four of my kids are in a position where they're potentially nervous or they're potentially in a state of fear, I like to take all four of them and I'll get down on their level, I'll look them in their eye and I'll ask them, do you trust dad? Do you trust me? Uh, if they experience something scary, right now just walking through my neighborhood, everybody's got like a 40 foot skeleton. Uh, if my kids ever walk through anything scary or fearful, uh, my thing is the best place they could possibly be is gripping my hand right next to them. Why is that? It's because I'm their dad. Uh, come hell or high water, I'll never let a bad thing happen to any four of my kids. And this morning, uh, we're going to see an example of this in the disciples. And we saw last week how the disciples were given instructions to share the good news with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we'll see this morning that Jesus kind of continues on and tells them what's going to happen when they do that. And this text this morning is very much a warning that when you go out and do what Christ has has assigned you to do, uh, really bad things might happen to you for the sake that you follow him. Uh, and so our big idea in these nine verses is simply this. It's that in the darkest of times, uh, we'll find out this morning that in the darkest of times, God can be trusted. Uh, and we're going to see in these nine verses uh, just really, really dark times of persecution. Uh, but as silly as a roller coaster is, uh, I want my son to know he can trust me. This morning, uh, we'll all see that as serious as life might get as a Christian, God wants you to know that you can trust Him. So just a little outline of how this is going to shake out. Uh, we're going to see in this text that in the darkest of times, God can be trusted first and foremost because He gave us His Spirit. 
Uh, He saved us. He right now rules and reigns over the world. And then lastly, that He calls us His. Uh, So we have a ton of work to do. Uh, So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to Matthew chapter 10. And while you do that, uh, let me go ahead and open us in a word of prayer. Uh, God, I thank You for this morning. Uh, Lord, I thank You for who You are. Lord, I thank You that You sit on Your throne. Uh, Lord, before uh, we dig into this text, just want to pray for Your people. Um, God, the situation that is happening in Israel right now, God, I pray peace over that situation. Uh, God, that you would protect the vulnerable. Um, Lord, that you would eradicate evil from this world. Um, God, that you would just be in the midst of your people. Uh, So, Lord, as we open up uh, your word, God, we see through all 66 books of the Bible how you're faithful to us. And so, God, this morning, I just pray that we can open your word and see that proclaiming your name sometimes is going to get us in sticky situations, but, God, you're right next to us. We can trust you through it. Uh, so, God, let your name be glorified as we open up Matthew 10 and be with us this morning. Just penetrate hearts where they need to be penetrated, and, Father, uh, work in this place. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. All right, so let's get going to verse 16. Uh, Jesus says this. He says, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. So last week's the instructions, now it's go time, right? Uh, I'm sending you out. And he tells them that they are going to be sheep in the midst of wolves. Uh, This is a little different than last week, right? Uh, Things are starting to up the intensity level. Uh, Last week, he kind of said, if you go into someone's house that is worthy, uh, stay there and have dinner, spend the night. But if you go to somebody's house who's unworthy, just leave. Uh, This week, you're going to see in the next verse, uh, it might not go well to where you might not just be able to leave. Uh, He's labeling his disciples, his apostles, the 12 disciples that he's sending out. He's telling them, you are sheep and you are going in the midst of wolves. Uh, We know sheep because we talk about sheep all the time. We're categorized as sheep. Uh, Sheep is animals. They're like the dumbest animals possible. They're not only dumb, they have no idea how to fight. Uh, The whole parallel passage in the book of Luke, Luke tells that Jesus said, you are going out as lambs among wolves. A lamb is just a 12-month or younger sheep, right? So Jesus is basically telling his disciples, look, I'm going to throw you out there to the wolves, and I'm going to categorize you as sheep. Well, thanks, Jesus. That sounds like an awesome plan. Uh, So then he tells them, be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Uh, So four animals going on here, right? They are sheep. They're going to be attacked by wolves, but they need to be as sheep, serpents, and doves. It's kind of confusing. Uh, So he says, be as shrewd as serpents. Uh, Depending on what version of the Bible you read, uh, that word can mean wise, crafty. If you remember Genesis 3.1, right, that the serpent in the garden was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. That's kind of how a snake is categorized all throughout Scripture. Even if you look at snakes today, half of them, half of us have snakes in our backyard half the time, right? Snakes are crafty. You just watch them operate. They're very good at self-preservation. They can move quickly. They can get out of the way quickly. They've been given all kinds of gifts from God to fight if they are attacked. So what Jesus is saying is you have to be as crafty as a serpent. You have to be as shrewd as a serpent. But on the other hand, you have to be as innocent as a dove. Uh, Other words for innocent would be harmless, simple, pure, gentle. Uh, For the disciples, they would have heard the word dove and seen a dove as a symbol of gentleness. Uh, What Jesus is saying is, look, if you are sheep and you're being thrown to a pack of wolves, be half snake, half dove. Be a crafty snake, but don't have the venom. Be a peaceful dove, but have the ability to handle yourself. For us today as Christians, when we go out and proclaim the gospel, we are to protect ourselves like a snake would. So be smart. Don't be dumb sheep. But we're also to when we handle people who don't believe the same things as us, we are to handle those people with a gentle heart. Uh, So how do we do that? It's the first point, right? It's because in the darkest of times, God can be trusted because He gave us His Spirit. Now, when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit invades your life, and the Holy Spirit serves as a guide in your life. Uh, the Spirit gives you things like discernment, uh, guides you on where to go, what doors to knock on, what doors not to knock on, uh, guides you where to stay away from. 
Without the Spirit in your life, you're just a sheep. You have no ability to be half snake, half dove. Without the Spirit, you're a sheep, and the wolves will be guaranteed to destroy you. So the Spirit doesn't just guide you. The Spirit actually gives you extra help. He gives you the words to say. Look at verses 17 and 18. This is where it gets serious. Jesus says, beware of them, that's the wolves, because they will hand you over to local courts and flog you in their synagogues. You will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness to them and to the Gentiles. So who's the them? Because of them, the them is the wolves, the people who last week, you'll knock on their door, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, they'd be called unworthy. Uh, You see, these people aren't just called unworthy. They're now in a position where they're hearing the message of Jesus Christ, and they're handing the disciples over to the local courts and flogging them in the synagogues. Uh, Matthew even says, you'll be brought before governors and kings. Uh, So when Jesus sends them out to these localized houses, uh, and they're given instructions to reach the house of Israel, each little village that they would go to in Israel would have a council of up to 23 Jews who would sit there and kind of hold responsibility of maintaining public order within that town. Uh, If you're in the Acts Bible study, or you just know the book of Acts really well, uh, you kind of see this happen over and over uh, to the apostles. The Jewish people uh, would get really tired of hearing Peter and John and then Paul talk about Christ, and what would they do? They'd bring them in and they would flog them. Uh, Flogging isn't beating someone to death, it's publicly flogging them as a way of punishment uh, for talking about Jesus Christ. Uh, So in verse 17, beware of them, that's the Jews. That's the Jews doing that to their own people. Uh, The Gentiles will do a little bit more. Verse 18, the Gentiles won't flog you in their synagogues, the Gentiles will bring you before governors or kings. Uh, Governors or kings are the highest ranking official in the land. You see Paul at the last part of the book of Acts, he stands before governors, he stands before kings, and why is that? In verse 18, Jesus says, you're going to be in that position because of me. Jesus says, it's not because of you, it's because of who I am. It's because of my name. But there's a reason for that. If you're brought before leaders because of your faith, that's not time to just run. That's not time for you to bounce because you're scared. That's time to tell the leaders who Jesus Christ is. That's time to testify that that same king that you've been sent by is the same king that saved you and he saved the world. It's no different than Peter in Acts 2 through 4. What do we see Peter do? He stands up in front of all these people. He's extremely bold. He lets them know clearly through the Old Testament who Jesus is, lets them know why they are unworthy, and then lets them know exactly exactly who they're denying. But most of us, we're just intimidated to share the gospel with a next door neighbor. Uh, how am I supposed to be bold in front of like the leaders in my community or the leaders of the world? Well, thankfully, Jesus already thought about that for you. Verse 19, he says, but when they hand you over, don't worry about how or what you're to speak for you will be given what to say at that hour because it isn't you speaking, but it's the spirit of your father that is speaking through you. So he gives us his spirit, right? That's an awesome thing. But look at the context of when this is happening. Uh, This verse is often taken out of context for people to be lazy with their Bible knowledge. Uh, What's Jesus talking about? If you're in the midst of persecution, if you're getting flogged, if you're getting beaten, If you're brought before kings and you're brought before governors because you can't shut your mouth about Jesus Christ, in that moment, there's no need to be nervous. The Spirit of your Father, that's the Holy Spirit, will speak through you. You'll be given what to say. So Jesus tells you, he says, don't worry about it. I remember in Matthew 6 when he says, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about the clothes that you need to put on your body. Don't worry about the food that you need to eat. I'll take care of all of that for you. It's the same word for worry here in Matthew 10 than it was in Matthew 6. And this time, it's through his spirit. God gives us his spirit. So in the darkest of times, God can be trusted because we have his spirit. That was back then in Matthew 10. That's the same thing today. What's the Spirit's job in your life? It's to teach you. It's to remind you. It's to guide you. And when the context is bearing witness to Christ, He literally will give you the words to say. Uh, If you're a Christian in this room, whether you're getting persecuted for what you believe, or maybe you're just going through a really, really dark time in your life right now, 
Uh, you're going through a trial. The Spirit is with you. The Spirit doesn't ebb and flow based on your mood or your circumstances. Many of us don't know a whole lot about the Holy Spirit, but here's what the Holy Spirit will do. The Holy Spirit's job is to make you more like Christ, give you the ability to share the gospel in such a way that you are as shrewd as a serpent, but you're as gentle as a dove, Uh, protects you before the most important people that you could possibly talk to, shows you what to say, how to operate, where to go, when to leave. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Uh, This portion of Matthew 10 is describing just some super dark times. None of us in here this morning are being persecuted like it is in Matthew 10. But in the midst of darkness, you can trust God because He's given you His Spirit. If He does it in the darkest of dark, why wouldn't He in the situation that you're currently in? Uh, But it gets worse. Verse 21 and 22 show us that when things get as bad as they possibly can, all you can do is lean on your salvation, which should be enough. So point two, in the darkest of times, God can be trusted because He saved you. Uh, Verse 21, Jesus says, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. Uh, It's one thing to be beat up in the synagogue It's a totally different thing to be brought before kings, but here in verse 21, you see Jesus move it from public persecution in a public square to now private persecution. He says a brother will betray a brother. A father will betray his brother. Children will rise up and have their parents be put to death. I just looked at this verse all week long and I thought about like, what if that was my family? Uh, I love my family, my wife, my four kids, If the family's done right, if your house is done right, the family should be the safest place that you ever go. It should be the safest place for me, my wife, my four children, that when they walk into our home, it's a safe place. It's where you should be able to go, where you walk through those doors and you are loved without conditions, you're loved for who you are. But we see here in verse 21, it's flipped. Jesus is saying there's a time that's going to come when things go completely backwards, Uh, That word betray is the same word that's used to describe Judas betraying Christ. Literally, family members giving their family up to governing authorities so that they can be executed. You go from being flogged in the synagogue to now being killed for your faith. That's just a different level of seriousness. Verse 22, Jesus says, why? Common theme of this text, right? You'll be hated by everyone. Why? Because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. You, the disciples, you're going to be hated. Us this morning, Jesus' disciples now, we will be hated by everyone. Not a few people, this is extreme. Everyone. Why? Because of the name of Christ. It's nothing you did, it's what Jesus did. You could be brought before kings and governors because of the name of Christ. You could be martyred because of the name of Jesus Christ. I know this isn't a text that is real encouraging, this is heavy. And I read this and I really want to know, do I love Jesus that much? This morning, as I stand here as your pastor, do I love Jesus to that amount? I was talking with Kristen on Thursday. Uh, This is like so far from where we're at. We're all in comfy little Waddell in Arizona. We live in the suburbs. We meet at a public school for church and these people love us here. There's no persecution. Oh, Michael, they made me wear a mask. That's not persecution. Do you love Jesus enough that you would legitimately be martyred for him? I think that's a decent question that any Christian should ask himself. I can honestly say that, yeah, do what you want with me. My life isn't mine. My life is Christ. It's Paul, right? To live is Christ. If I'm here on earth, it's to glorify Christ. If, you, if I die, I get to be with Christ. To live is Christ, to die is gain. What, are you going to kill me so I could be with Jesus? So some of you in this room who maybe aren't Christians are probably thinking I'm out to lunch. But here's why I think that. Here's why all of us in this room should think like that. Look at the end of the verse. Jesus says, he who endures to the end will be saved. True discipleship, true discipleship means that you persevere right through whatever trial the world is going to throw at you. I'm going to say that again. True discipleship means that you persevere through whatever trial the world will throw in your way. It means that when any level of darkness comes, you are the light so you do not run. In the darkest of times, God can be trusted because he saved you. Uh, Think of the first Christian martyr in Acts chapter 7, Stephen. 
Before Stephen gets killed, what happens? He looks up in the sky and he sees a vision. He looks up in the heavens and he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God the Father. Keep that in your head for just a second. He sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The reason that we can trust God, even in the midst of dark times, so dark that you might get martyred for for Him, is because you've been saved by Him, and He sits at the right hand of God the Father waiting for you. That the minute that you die, maybe you've never thought of this before, All of us in this room, one day we'll die. And the minute we die, our soul either goes to heaven or our soul either goes to hell. The minute you die, those of us in this room that are Christians will be immediately with Christ. That's what the Bible tells us. We don't know what that looks like. We're like spirits. What does it look like? I don't know. Uh, But all I know is when I die, I get to be with Christ. It's going to be a lot better than what I'm at right now. So if you're sick in this room, so my dad passed away in July. He had Alzheimer's. The minute he died, he did not have Alzheimer's anymore. His brain was completely healthy. So if you're sick and you die, you're immediately healthy with Christ. If you're beaten in a synagogue, you're beaten in a church, you're beaten in a prison, to death, you die. And the minute you die, you're in the midst of Christ and you're fully loved. It's the opposite. If Christ saved you, You are put on this earth for a reason, and that's to glorify him. So if Christ is trustworthy enough to save you, he should be trustworthy enough to guide you through extreme levels of darkness. If you're drowning in the midst of an ocean and a boat comes and saves you, you'll be loyal to the men in that boat. If Christ saved you from the reality of hell, and you're a Christian in here this morning, it shouldn't be such a difficult thing that we're obedient to him in such a way that even if things go completely sideways in your life, you trust that he will continue to take care of you. So in the darkest of times, God can be trusted because he saved you. So let's move to verse 23 because this is where we place our confidence. Here in verse 23, we see that in the darkest of times, God can be trusted because he rules the world. Jesus gives instruction. He says in verse 23, he says, When they persecute you in one town, flee to another. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Super confusing verse. Uh, Remember last week, if the house is unworthy, you just leave. Here, if the town's going to persecute you, just leave that town. And he makes an interesting comment that a lot of people misunderstand. He says, just leave and move on to the next town because they will not make it through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Uh, So crowd participation. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. All right, so we read this and we think right away, well, Christ hasn't returned yet. Certainly all the towns of Israel have heard the name of Jesus, right? Let me show you what this actually means. Old Testament book of Daniel. So we know book of Daniel because he was in a lion's den, uh, fiery furnace, all that stuff. But Daniel is largely a book of prophecy. Uh, Daniel 7.13 is a prophetic word. Uh, Daniel prophesies this. He says, I continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like what? A son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He, the one like a son of man, approached the ancient of days and was escorted by him. So here we see one who is like the Son of Man, prophesied hundreds of years before Christ comes to the earth, right? One who is like the Son of Man. What does Jesus refer to himself as in Matthew 10? The Son of Man. So we see the one like the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven, and he approaches the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? God. So you see Trinitarian things happening here in Matthew 10. So this is a prophecy of Daniel of Jesus approaching God the Father. So God the Son approaching God the Father in the clouds. And what happens in verse 14? It says, He was given, He is Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. That's Jesus in heaven, being given a kingdom that's everlasting, a kingdom that will not be destroyed, a kingdom that will not pass away. So there's no need to answer this aloud, but when does that actually happen in Scripture? Uh, Right before Jesus dies in Matthew 26, he tells the Jewish leaders, he says, but I tell you in the future, you will see what? The Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, power, capital P, at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus says that right before he's murdered on a cross. Jesus then dies 
He's resurrected, comes out of the tomb three days later. He stands before the disciples in the crowd in Matthew chapter 28, and he gives like the most famous verse in all the Bible, right? The Great Commission. And what does Jesus say in the Great Commission? He says, all authority, all the authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So then what's our instructions? Go therefore and make disciples of who? All the nations. So Jesus dies, he resurrects, He's given all authority on heaven and earth, just what Daniel prophesied. And with that authority, he then tells the, he tells the disciples, he tells us today, go and make disciples of all nations. It's no longer just the house of Israel anymore. It's all nations. And we see in Acts that either, even after Christ ascends and goes in the clouds to be with God the Father and he's in heaven, you see Peter and the apostles, they're still not even close to being done in proclaiming the name of God to every house in Israel. So now that I've confused everybody in this room, uh, back to verse 23. The disciples are given a task. Go through all the houses of Israel until I ascend, essentially. Now that Christ has ascended, now that Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father right now as we sit here this morning, we in turn, applicable to us, we are his disciples. We are now given instruction. All of us in this room have a duty to go out and reach the nations for his gospel. We see that within the context of this section, that sharing the gospel has a consequence that you might get persecuted. The reason for my point that in the darkest of times, God can be trusted because he rules the world is because that's a fact. As we sit here this morning, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father up in heaven. As Jesus sits there, the Bible tells us that he holds all things under his control. What that means for you personally is that you have nothing to worry about because Christ stands up there and he is sovereign over every single detail of your life. Whatever it looks like, if it's light or dark in your life, if it's light or dark outside, whatever the circumstances are, Christ is on the throne. He's been giving an everlasting kingdom that if you're a Christian in this room, do you know that you're adopted into that kingdom and nobody can ever take you away from that? That should give us the ability to draw near to Christ with confidence. We move forward as Christians and we can be confident because what can man do to us? What can life throw at you that Christ doesn't have under his hand? Christ is on the throne. You can't get him off of it. So final point, and then I'll land the plane. This is where it hits home to all of us personally. In the darkest times, God can be trusted because he calls you his. Look at verse 24. Jesus says, A disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. It is enough for a disciple to become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If they called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So a disciple cannot be more advanced than his teacher. A disciple is a learner. Uh, So the more you learn, if you learn more than the teacher, your teacher is no longer your teacher. You get it? Uh, It's impossible to do that with Jesus. Uh, The holiest person in this room, uh, somebody, one of you out there, uh, every minute of every hour of every single day, you can push and push and push to be more like Christ. You're never going to reach perfection like he was. So Jesus makes a point. He says, if they called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more are the members of his household? So if they call me that, how much more would they call you that? Uh, We'll see in Matthew 12 that the leaders called Jesus Beelzebul. So half of you are like, what does that mean? Uh, That's the name in Hebrew given to foreign gods. Uh, That word means Lord of flies or Lord of dung. Uh, What that was is is the Hebrews' way of basically um, every God outside the one true God of Israel, uh, that's what they would call. It was an insult. So in the New Testament, the Pharisees would call anything remotely evil would be labeled Beelzebul to basically put the label of the devil on it. So when they assault Jesus with this, he's obviously making the point that he's not that. Instead, He's the disciples' rabbi. He's their savior. He's our savior. And he's saying that you can't be him, but we can be like him. Why? Because we're members of his household. So what's the practical implication of that? It means that when you're saved, he calls you to be his. 
When you are saved, you are adopted into his family. You're now an adopted child of God. You are his son or you are his daughter. You are now a member of that household. So therefore, we are called as members of the household. Matthew or Jesus uses the example of a slave to a master. Uh, what is he trying to say? We are called to do what our teacher does. So if our teacher is Christ, Remember the first point, he's given us his spirit. When you become a Christian, the spirit's given to you, and you should look more like Christ as you walk in Christ. So one year, five year, ten years down the road from now, uh, you should see growth in your walk with Christ. But again, what's the context of this passage? Uh, You cannot be above your master. As a Christian, if you're called to be like Jesus, this means that you most likely at some point or another in your life will suffer for the sake of the gospel. You can't surpass Christ, and He suffered way worse than any of us ever will. But in your suffering, when those times come, those are opportunities for you to be more like Christ. The reason that you suffer is because of Him. The reason that you suffer is because you're a member of His household. If the master suffers, so will the people in His house. But the suffering is what makes you like Him. The suffering may be uncomfortable. The suffering might even kill you. But our chief aim in this life is not comfort. Our chief aim is to be like Christ. And we can do that because we're His. So what's the point of all this? Uh, Our text this morning, verses 16 through 25, is describing intense persecution that will and has already and will come uh, to some Christians. And what I've tried to get you to see with multiple angles is that in times of darkness, we serve a God who can be trusted. Uh, So my takeaway this morning, the thing that you need to leave your seat with this morning is what is the thing that God is asking you to trust him with right now? Again, assuming none of us are being like seriously persecuted, I would guess that some of us in this life feel that right now we're being tested. Uh, So what is that thing God is asking you to trust him with, but yet you're not willing to really fully trust him with it? What is your doubt that he's good? Uh, To make this easier, what's the most difficult thing in your life right now? I'm sure I say that. It takes us all but five seconds to think of something. What's the most difficult thing in your life right now? Once you've thought about that thing, think hard of in the context of that thing, what is God asking you to trust him more in the context of what you're struggling with? Do you have a wayward child? I want you to see this morning that God can be trusted. Is your marriage on the rocks? God can be trusted. Do you have really hard decisions? You seem to have a lot on your plate right now. God can be trusted. Maybe there's a relationship that you know full well in your heart of hearts you should not be in right now. You can trust God. Maybe you have a sin that you keep hidden. You're so entangled in this sin and you just keep white knuckle fighting that sin. God wants you to know this morning, he can be trusted. So what is that thing God is asking you to trust him with? I hope you've seen this morning that he's probably good enough to handle it. If he's with you, as we've seen this morning, in intense levels of persecution, what makes you think that God disappears from your day-to-day issues? If you can trust God in the little things, it makes it much easier to trust God when things get unbelievably difficult. When you get to the difficult, you could look back at your life and the faithfulness of God and say, you know what, I remember God moving here. I remember God providing for me back then and what those things are markers in your life that increase your faith. Uh, So to close, I just want to challenge us. Uh, I don't know why, but I was preparing this sermon. uh, I just kept thinking, there's some of you sitting in this room who God is nothing but a game to you. If you are persecuted to the level of this passage, you read that passage this morning and you know deep down inside, if that's you, you'd be like, I'm out. I want you to challenge, I want to challenge you this morning Trust Christ with your life. Uh, Those of you in this room that think you're Christians and you're not, trust your life to Christ this morning. Uh, That sin that's pulling you back, repent of that sin this morning and trust it to Christ. Christ nailed your sin to the cross when he died on your behalf. Stop playing with your sin and give that to him. Uh, Those of you that walked in this room this morning and you've just been playing this game where Jesus is like your little homeboy, He's the guy on the side who gives you good advice. The Bible's a cute little book. Christianity and Christ are just a part of your week. Would you get off the fence and live your life for Christ starting this morning? I don't know where everyone's at in this room. I don't know the spiritual condition of all the people at this church. Uh, Some of you, as you walk in here, I know for a fact you're walking through very intense times of personal darkness right now. Some of you, 
uh, will be called to the mission field, and this might happen to you. Some of you might need to file this sermon away for 10, 15 years from now. But in the here and now, while we're not being persecuted, I think it's pretty clear that one day that will come. Uh, but right now, in the here and now, what is God asking you to trust Him with as you leave here this morning? All of us in here. If you're walking with Christ, if you're not walking with Christ, you've got small issues, you've got huge issues, you're not being persecuted at all, you're being heavily persecuted. What's your situation? What is God asking you to trust Him with this morning? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank You for Your goodness. Uh, Lord, I thank You that in times of darkness, You don't leave. Uh, God, I thank You that uh, Your Word is very clear that in times of persecution, times of uh, just intense hatred, uh, God, You give very specific instructions. Uh, God, You tell us to not worry. Uh, Lord, You continue to show us through Your Word how Your Son sits on the throne and is sovereign over all things. Uh, Lord, I pray that we can have that attitude as we leave here this morning. Uh, God, that as we leave here and we go into a dark world, Lord, we're not scared of it. Uh, God, that we're bold in the way that we proclaim your name. Whatever consequences that brings, God, let us cling to you knowing that you saved us. Uh, Lord, you've given us so many different gifts. Uh, Lord, you've equipped your people to do your work. So I just pray that you give us a boldness to do that. Uh, Father, I pray for the person in this room that does not know you, uh, the person that knows of you, but they've never given their life to you. Uh, God, I pray that they can stop playing the game this morning and understand that a life with you is a life of glory, God, a life of grace, uh, one where you lead us and you guide us and you make us more like your son. Uh, so God, whatever you have to do to hearts in this room, Lord, I pray, I pray, pray that you do it. Uh, God, that you'd work in and through this church to be a beacon of light in our community. Uh, Lord, that whatever next year brings, whatever the political landscape brings, God, we are loyal to you because you're the one who sits on the throne. So God, just push us today. Uh, Lord, what are the things that I need to trust you with? What are the things that everybody in front of me needs to trust you with? And God, let us come to the throne knowing that you're a good God that can be trusted uh, because you never leave us. So God, we give these things to you this morning. And Lord, I ask that you work on hearts in this room to move us closer to you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.